Anne Boleyn is, in many respects, the most important, the most controversial and influential Queen Consort to have ever sat on the throne of England. Despite her many achievements, her colourful life and her bold radical religious ideas, her story is often reduced to placid historical romance or distorted to include the myth and bias superstition that followed her death. I for one am pretty tired of this portrayal. I think authors of late have done Anne a great injustice in their boring, one-dimensional vision, and I hope that in time, her truth will become more widely embraced. This section will focus on what is often the most overlooked aspect of Anne Boleyn's life. Her radical, often dangerous, and unprecedented religious opinions. It is often believed that Anne's ambition and selfish desire fueled her thirst for reform, and because of the obvious advantage that would eventually arise from such a belief, I can see why this is alleged. It is however clear that the fire for Anne's religious beliefs was ignited long before, during her time spent in France. Nicholas Sanders and early historians were under the impression that the flame of reform had passed from the French king's sister, Marguerite. Since Anne's service for the latter is unlikely, we can assume that it was during Anne's service to Queen Claude, who was herself far from hostile to the evangelical position, that Anne would have encountered those seeking spiritual change. France, as with numerous other countries in Western Europe, was a hotbed of religious ferment. Jacques Lefebvre, the spark from within the French reformist move, believed, like Luther, that the true faith could only be realised when accessible to all, and when heard in their own language. Unlike Luther, however, Lefebvre did not go as far as to break with Rome. Marguerite, the king's sister, soon became a protective patron over the movement, and a role model for the distant, yet admiring young Anne. It is important to realise that at this early stage of reform, Anne certainly did not reject all of the established religion. It is well documented, for instance, that Anne did receive communion prior to her death, and took an oath whilst receiving the consecrated wine and bread, effectively proving her innocence. The idea that transubstantiation had occurred, that the bread and wine had become Jesus Christ, was certainly not in question for Anne. In fact, when Tristan Revel attempted to present a piece of work by Francois Lambert of Avignon in 1536, which denied the sacrifice of the Mass, Anne flatly refused to receive it. Reform at this time was focused on shedding myth and superstition, and to work religion backwards to its true meaning. It was not the aim to bury the old and create a new. One aspect of the reformist concern that Anne excelled in was in taking great responsibility for the poor, and setting a role model example to her subjects and for future Protestant reformists. Latimer tells us of Anne's charity towards the deserving poor and needy. Her royal Maunday money was considerably increased, and her ladies sewed clothes for the poor, which were distributed on progression, with a shilling per person. Pregnant women also received two clean sheets and two shillings. The cynic can easily reduce this public charity to simply buying affection, by effectively outdoing Queen Catherine, her predecessor. It is however proven to be a genuine sign of her dedication to religion, when one looks into her private gestures of charity, of which there were many. For example, a parishioner of Hugh Latimer, whose entire herd of cattle had died, was personally received by Queen Anne in 1535. The family were interviewed, and gifted a generous £20. The effects of Anne's personal religion really cannot be understated, as they would play a large part in the English Reformation. A number of the key players who would reform England's religion after Anne's death have been patronised and elevated by Anne. Hugh Latimer, Thomas Goodrich, Nicholas Shaxton, her almoner John Skip and the great reformer Cranmer were all supported by Anne. We can also clearly see Anne's concern for religious change when studying the changes within the monastic houses. When visiting Gloucestershire in 1535, Anne sent a party of her chaplains ahead to view the blood of Christ at the Abbey of Hales. Upon discovering that the blood, which miraculously didn't clot, was in fact renewed weekly with duck's blood, Anne pressed for it to be removed. Anne also visited the nuns of Sion in 1535, 
Initially she was refused entry, upon the grounds that she was married, and therefore could not enter under the rules of the order, and refused to leave. She was eventually allowed to enter, and the nuns received Anne prostrate with their faces to the ground. Anne addressed the audience, addressing their moral decline and rebuking them for persisting with Latin primas which they did not understand. Anne offered them English alternatives, to which they reluctantly agreed. Towards the end of her life, it is clear that Anne had a very large preoccupation with the Bible. It was a topic that she discussed openly and frequently, and would often debate regarding this subject with Henry at the dinner table. According to Latimer, Anne openly flew her flag of support for the English Bible by openly displaying it in her rooms and inviting people to read from it. It is very likely that it was Tyndale's Bible that Anne displayed, and her copy still exists, proudly embellished with her arms and initials. We really must not underplay the significance of this public display, as this was a banned book in England. People had before and would continue to burn for such an action. Anne had long made such risks for the sake of religion, and indeed in turn for her own gain. During the divorce proceedings, Anne cunningly used her highly illegal readings to her advantage, initiating a path that would quite literally change the course of history. Anne had obtained, amongst other illegal literature, a copy of William Tyndale's The Obedience of the Christian Man and How Christian Rulers Ought to Govern. It was an extremely risky purchase on behalf of Anne, as Wolsey was currently undertaking a purge of heretical books. She lent the book to Anne Gainsford, who in turn lent it to her betrothed, George Zouche. He was caught reading the illegal text by a dean, and was passed to Wolsey for interrogation. Anne pleaded Zouche's case, and did not stop when he was acquitted. She also pleaded the case for Tyndale's work, and read a passage to the king. The king is the person of God, and his law is God's law, Anne boldly proclaimed and through her courage and commitment to her evangelical beliefs, the divorce proceedings began to take a very different path, and would eventually lead to the unthinkable decision to break with Rome. Anne was a maker of history, a deeply religious, highly intelligent, ruthless and unruly woman. She is multicoloured, multi-layered and with depth beyond the lifeless portrayals that have often reduced her to a queen who lost her head. She is worth more, and her story, her true story, has yet to be touched by so few people.